We looked at First John last Sunday, and uh, I told you that we're going to be moving through this uh, letter that John has written to uh, the church. And uh, we noticed last week that the key themes here are fellowship and love. Fellowship and love. That when we have fellowship with God, then that kind of fellowship is enhanced by the love that we have for God and also it will motivate us to have love for people around us. And we also said that undergirding these, this main theme or themes are three very important thoughts that God is light. Therefore, we who want to have fellowship with God must walk in that light. God is life and therefore we must look forward to possessing and exercising His quality of life. And thirdly, that God is love and that we must walk in that knowledge that God is love and exercise that kind of love. And then we also said that First John can be split into two basic parts that talk about the basis of our fellowship with God. The basis of our fellowship with God which really spans from the first verse to 227 and then the behavior of fellowship. John kind of outlines for us what it looks like of somebody who has fellowship with God, what kind of behavior emanates from him or her. And so you find that in 228 down to chapter 521. And then we also saw that he was writing to believers, writing to believers and so he could be and is speaking to us as well. But then he was writing because there were two heresies or two uh, key sins uh, that were coming into the world at that time. One was heresies, different philosophies that were coming in to try and take people away from the truth. And the other was uh, the lure of uh, just worldliness. And uh, we looked at uh, the, the three things that uh, can come to uh, corrupt us in our walk with the Lord. I wanted us to move on to the and do chapter 2 and uh, spent a lot of time this week just looking at uh, the entire chapter going right up to uh, looking at Christ our advocate not to love the world and then the promise of eternal life but I kept coming back to just the the first and second verse of first John chapter 2 and uh, John says this he says my little children I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That word kai in the Greek is often translated but or and, uh, and different versions have translated differently. But if anyone sins, or and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation or the substitute for our sins. And not for us only, but for those of the whole world. You know, I, I read this uh, particular verse and I thought last week as we looked at this first uh, chapter, we came to the point where we realized that if we truly want to have fellowship with a living God, then we need to get rid of that one barrier that will stay between us and God and prevent that fellowship. And we saw that that barrier is sin. But then we also saw the good news that was tucked into verse 9 of the first chapter that says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there we saw that God when he looks down at us, understands that we are prone to sin. That we are a people who will fall. And he has made provision for that. Not that we walk in that sin. John is very clear in this letter when he demarcates between falling into sin and practicing sin. The one that talks about practicing sin, he says he, you would really need to check and see whether you know God if your lifestyle hasn't changed. 
But after knowing the Lord, it is possible that you will get tricked. You will get tripped up. And he talks to us later on about the things that come, very different philosophies that will come. And as we look at our world, we know that that is prevalent today. That the truth gets just slightly distorted and we think that it is the truth. But any truth that has been uh, diminished is not the truth. And so we need to be so very careful. And I told you about the Apostles' Creed last week. Why it is that we spend so much of time in confirmation classes trying to understand what the Apostles' Creed is all about. Because the Apostles' Creed is what we call the irreducible core of the gospel. You cannot take anything away from the creed without making it a cult. That's how you will recognize a cult. You will find that there will be one part of the creed which becomes a distortion in their belief system. And there is so much of that today. And we so need to keep coming back to the Word of God and say, what does the Word of God have for us? How do I walk my life? What does it say about these things? What are principles that must be such an integral part of my life? I was talking to young professionals last night and I was telling them, we were talking about just commitment and how it, commitment is, is beginning to be so uh, rare these days. Commitment to so many things, right from marriages to, to brands, we find that commitment levels are dropping. And as I spoke to them, I said, we need to be able to be sure about what it is that we are committed to first. Because when we look at people and we think, for example, that a cricketer was committed to cricket and then found a little later that he wasn't committed to cricket but was committed to money. And so you see how a misguided commitment can get one into trouble. And how we need to be secure about the things that are foundational for us. And I was telling them that what we need to do is to be looking at the values that we have, the belief system that we have, that will then contribute to the behavior. Anthropologically, they, they talk about the, the three circles that are in our lives. Our belief system informs our value system. And our value system is what makes and accounts for behavior. Behavior is what we call our worldview. And we always interact with each other at a worldview level. But change happens when belief systems are changed. Because then belief systems will inform values that we have. And the values will determine behavior. And so it, it's so important to have a right understanding of what are the values that we need to have. And as we look at First John, he's saying, be very, very careful. Because lies and falsehood can come so easily and undermine things. And if we are not sure what it is we believe in, we can fall. The old adage is still so true. If you don't stand for something, you can fall for anything, isn't it? So what is the foundation? Do you have a good foundation? Is your belief system strong? Do you look at the Bible and have the Bible inform you? about where and what you ought to be doing. And so, as John talks about this, he talks about being careful about that, but he says, because these are the things that will underwrite fellowship, will take away fellowship. And if by some chance that has happened to you, then make sure that you do what it takes to come back. And then we see that beautiful verse, if we confess our sins. And we ended with that last week, and so many of you, we're bold to stand and say, there is an area of darkness in my life that I want the Lord to take. For God is light and in Him there is no darkness. If we are truly walking in the light, we cannot walk in darkness. The two are mutually exclusive. And so as I thought about you and I thought about the stand that you took, I thought it is so important for us to understand verses 1 and 2. Because what happened when you took that stand and said, Lord, I confess my sin? What is it that happens? I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for those of the whole world. You know, the word that is used here is a legal term. Is a legal term. We have an advocate. We have a lawyer who stands up for you and for me. I want you to picture this. Why is John giving us this kind of an imagery? Because this is exactly what is happening in the he heavenly realms. We have God who is the judge. We have God who is the judge. And then we have us. We stand before a holy judge. And we stand guilty of sin. And the one who stands to this side and looks at God and points his finger at us is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is the accuser of the, of the brethren. And he does this day and night, constantly. He is going to the Lord's presence and he's pointing to you and to me. And he's saying, look what they did. Look what she did. Look what he did. You're a just God. What are you going to do about it? And God is judge. And he has spoken in his word that the guilty will be punished. And I want you to just take some time. If you want, note down these scriptures that I'm going to give you. There are too many of them that we can turn to one by one. But I want you to see that God has said, for example, in Exodus 34, 7, we read how he keeps loving kindnesses for thousands who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. And all of this is so beautiful. And then yet it says, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. By no means leave the guilty unpunished. See, beloved, at the core of who God is, while he is love, he is a just God. He is a God of justice. And this is what he says, no means, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Look at Nahum 1.3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. By no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Proverbs 11:21. Assuredly, assuredly, the evil man will not go unpunished. The evil man will not go unpunished. Look with me at Numbers 14:18. The Lord is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty. He will by no means clear the guilty. God is very clear that he is a God of justice, that if people transgress his holy laws, they will be punished. And this is what Satan stands before God and reminds him as he accuses you and me, he brings these words before God and says, You're a God of justice. What are you going to do about those who have transgressed the law? Because remember God has said, The wages of sin is death. The punishment that God has said will happen for those who sin is death. Beloved, I want to say this as gently and sensitively as I can say. I know that so many of us have loved ones and that we pray for them day and night praying that God would somehow let his revelation be birthed in them as well. And I know that for you to hear these words from scripture must be anguish and yet beloved the truth is that that is the word of God and if anything even as you feel your your heart torn 
for loved ones don't ever give up on them because God's word is true and what he says he will do he will do it must only go to spur us on to take every make every day count God is a just God R.C. Sproul famous preacher preached a sermon that shocked so many of the people that he was speaking to when he said this we are saved really we think we are saved from unrighteousness and sin and bad habits and uh, foul language and coarse uh, jokes no we are really saved from god we are really saved from god because god has exacting standards that he has laid down but he said the good news is that we are saved by god from god and that's the good news of the gospel saved by god because in the midst of god at his core while he is a just god he is a merciful god as well and yet if you are just you can't be merciful if you are merciful then you are condoning sin you cannot be just how does god bring these two seeming polarities together he brought them together at the cross beloved he brought them together at the cross that's what he means when he says we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous and he himself is the propitiation for our sins as satan accuses us in front of god jesus stands on the other side and he says that one that one is mine i have paid the price and paid the penalty of that sin and in god's eyes when that penalty has been paid then he is able to be just and forgive us of our sins forgiveness can only come when the penalty of sin has been paid that's what our defense attorney does he stands he ever stands to intercede for you and for me ever stands to intercede on the one hand is satan constantly accusing on the other hand is the son of god constantly interceding and says that one is mine that one is mine that one is mine that one is mine for he is the propitiation the substitute for us look at these beautiful verses in isaiah i'm sorry hebrews 7:25 therefore he that is jesus is able to save forever those who draw near to god through him since he always lives to make intercession for them he always lives to make intercession for them what did he do look at these scriptures beloved second corinthians 5:21 he made him that is god made jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of god in him he made jesus who knew no sin take our sin so that we might become the righteousness of god in him first peter 2:24 and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for his by his wounds we are healed isaiah 53 4 to 6 says this surely our griefs he himself bore 
and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. But the Lord was pleased in verse 10 to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Beloved, this is why when we talk to our pre-Christian friends, those who don't yet know the Lord, and they inquire of us, why is it so important that Jesus is in the equation? You ought to be able to point to these scriptures. You ought to be able to point to God as a righteous judge. You ought to be able to talk about the accuser of the brethren. You ought to be able to say from the word of God and from our own experiences that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have. We stand condemned. God knows it. Satan knows it. We know it. We stand condemned. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why the Christian faith is so unique. Without Christ, if you take Christ out of Christianity, there can be no remedy for sin. No remedy. If you ever hear the question, why is Jesus so important? This is how you need to answer it. Without Christ, there is no substitute to take the penalty of my sin. He is the propitiation. He is the propitiation. And having done that, he stands as my defense attorney. He stands as my advocate in front of God, constantly interceding with him. Constantly interceding for you and for me. Beloved, that is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of the gospel. That is what is contained in the scriptures. As we look at the New Testament, the good news is this, that there has been a substitutionary sacrifice and the penalty for our sins has been paid. And therefore, only then can sins be forgiven. And the forgiveness of sins is a prerequisite for fellowship with God. The question that almost begs to be asked this morning is, on the one hand, is he your defense attorney? Is he your defense attorney? Are you sure that, he, that you've got a lawyer? Are you sure that Jesus is your lawyer? Oh beloved, I just pray that there is not a single person in this room who has not prayed that prayer. Because unless you have bought into what he has done at the cross. Unless you have bought into what he has done at the cross and say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I face death. And I recognize that you have paid the penalty. And I ask that that penalty be appropriated in my name. Unless you have made that your prayer, you stand condemned. You stand condemned. 
And you may think that you have grown up in the church, you have doing all sorts of things, you read the Bible, but if you haven't made that one commitment to Him, or made that transaction, that prayer, you will stand condemned. Because no amount, beloved, of knowledge of a good advocate who can come and help you fight your case, if you don't hire that advocate, you'll never get his services. It's true of the physical world as it is too true of the spiritual world. Do you know him today? Not only as your advocate, but also know as him as one who continuously intercedes for you, beloved. Intercedes for you. And that's good news for us. Because as I was thinking of all of you who stood last week, you accepted that you needed to confess and that God would forgive. I'm sure, I'm sure that the evil one has come and tried to remind you about something you did and said, you thought you were forgiven. Boy, no, you haven't changed at all. And you felt condemned once again. I want to remind you what the word says, that he ever, ever, ever lives to intercede for you and for me. Sushmita, you had the, the old uh, hymn book that uh, was there. Is that an old hymn book at the back there? Just Can I have that for a minute? Charles Wesley has put that into uh, just such beautiful w words and I want to read that to you because it puts this whole thing, this whole idea in such beautiful perspective. He says this, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands. Before the throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, His precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Five bleeding wounds He bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive Him, oh forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh forgive, they cry, nor let that ransomed sinner die. The Father hears him pray, his dear anointed one. He cannot turn away the presence of his Son. His Spirit answers to the blood, his Spirit answers to the blood, and tells me, I am born of God. My God is reconciled. His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child. I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh. With confidence I now draw nigh. And Father, Father, Abba, Father, cry. That's the story of salvation right there in the words of Charles Wesley. So beautiful. He ever, ever, ever lives to intercede. For you and for me. Romans 1.16 would give us a fitting response, beloved, to what we have heard. It says this, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. Why? It is the power of God at work. Saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. I can never be ashamed of this good news. Never. Because I stand free, uncondemned, forgiven, with his righteousness put on me. 
because of the finished work at Calvary. And that's the good news. Two things I want to leave with you, beloved. Two things. Number one, and most important of all, do you know Him? Have you accepted Him as your Lord and your Savior? He cannot intercede for you if you have not made that transaction. He cannot. Much as He wants to, much as He wants to, He cannot. And the second is this. If you are a, a born again believer, you are in Christ. And in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. There is no condemnation for you. And if you are sensing condemnation, take this mental picture with you. God the judge sitting and looking at you, condemned. Satan, the accuser, pointing his finger at you, reminding God of his justice. And then this beautiful picture of Jesus right there with his outstretched hands, showing the wounds with which he bore the penalty of your sin. And God seeing his son and offering forgiveness because the penalty has been paid. Therefore now there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Beloved, I'm going to invite you this morning. If you haven't yet asked Jesus to be your Savior, and the Spirit of God has been speaking to you this morning, I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you. I want to invite you to, to make a prayer that will allow Jesus to become your surety. And I want to invite you to stand this morning. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. I'm going to ask you to just stand where you are and make it a public thing that this day in my life, I'm inviting Jesus to be my Savior. And I'd like to pray for you. If there's anyone here who is responding to that this morning, I want to invite you to stand. If you've never made a com commitment to the Lord, I plead with you, don't leave this room without doing so. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That this room has ones who have accepted you. Lord, we give you honor and praise. Lord, I pray now for those who often think that they are condemned and believe the lies of Satan. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would come alongside of them and let them see you interceding for them before the throne constantly. Master, encourage us this morning that when the evil one comes and tries to trap us or be believe that we are condemned, that we can point to scriptures and tell him that the one who has paid the penalty for us intercedes also for us and that we are a forgiven people this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would etch
that message upon each one of our hearts this morning. For Lord Jesus, it's in your most beautiful and precious, wonderful name that we pray these things. Amen.